So my name is David Birchfield. I'm an associate professor at Arizona State University and also the co-founder of a small startup called Small Lab Learning that's charged with, with uh, developing a sustainability plan for some of the work that I'll be talking about today. So I'm presenting on behalf of my, myself and my colleague, Mina Johnson Glenberg. Um, so I don't actually have robots either, which were awesome, but I do have something that everyone has talked about, but no one has actually been brave enough to put up on their slides yet. So wait for it. All right, I have a couple of these actually. So, you know, part of what we're engaged in doing is building learning environments. So I want to at least talk about, you know, just lay it bare, right? So classrooms 100 years ago, classrooms today, and you might say, well, that's not 21st century. And so this in many cases is what we see in the 21st century classroom, right? So it's basically the same setup, but you've got desktop computing there. And part of what we've been doing in our work, we're gonna be talking about embodied learning, and learning where that comes from, where we think it's going. And really that's premised on trying to think about K-12 learning environments and how they can change the, through the introduction of these different kinds of technologies. So what we think learning can look like is something like this. Uh, these are our colleagues at a school in New York called Quest to Learn, learning about science and systems. Here they're learning about fractions in a very different kind of way. And here they're learning about perspective taking and story and narrative. And so just fundamentally, just showing these images, trying to give a sense of kind of a vision for what we think embodied learning could look like and how much of what we think about K-12 classrooms, these platforms can play an important role. So one of the things that we've seen is that really the premise for a lot of this is that the desktop computing uh, paradigm is really dominant, right? So you've got single user interaction, you've got a mouse keyboard kind of interface, and you have primarily a visual modality. And predominantly we see this over and over. And, and what we're sort of arguing for is that there's some other alternatives to this, to this in particular using emerging technology. And for us, we really see that at the intersection of human computer interaction research and the learning sciences. So asking this question, kind of what do we see at least as kind of the next phase, if we're moving beyond a paradigm of just desktop computing, what would that look like? So I want to kind of lay out the premise for that and then, and then show you some of our work that, that at least uh, shows one example of that moving forward. Again, we view this as being really at the intersection of HCI and learning sciences, so let me give you a little bit of a backstory on that. So in HCI, we're looking at blended interfaces in particular, so interfaces that really bridge across the physical and digital domains. And you really see this prevalent in computer gaming industry, you know, really with these kinds of examples that are really seeing all the time. So the Wii here, people interacting in different kind of ways. Same thing with the PlayStation Move, same thing with Xbox Connect, and the same thing with whatever's happening in this picture here, which... <laughs> so, Right, I don't exactly know, but it seemed like it was important to include this in the talk, uh, <laughs> one way or another. So there's something just different that's happening here, and, and what, what we would argue is that it's only possible because of the technology itself and thinking closely about the interface that's being used, and that's really what we're interested in, and trying to think about how we can push on that, not only in the rest home environment, but also in the, in the K-12 environment. Okay, so the next piece of this is learning sciences, and there's, there's another trend that we've, that we've been looking at, which is embodied cognition, so I want to talk a little bit about that and then, and then get to where we're applying this. So we've known for a long time that there's a strong connection between mind and body, so the discovery of neurons and the structure of the brain. More recently, understanding mirror neurons and how those play an important role in how we understand, how we engage with the world is really critical to that. So there's a lot of neurocognitive research that, that you know, has really brought this, uh, brought this to the fore, and fMRI research, which is showing that if you look at particular kinds of words, so subjects where they hear a word like grasp, and you see activity in the parts of the brain that control motor function. Okay, so you might expect that if you've got a statement like grasping a pencil, it's really kind of motor driven. But what we see is that even with abstract concepts like grasping an idea, you see the same kinds of brain activity unfolding, and that tells us that there's something really fundamental that's going on between the mind and the Body. Okay. There's another study that came out from Pulvermuller, which is looking at a simi similar kind of uh, phenomena where you have three words, lick, pick, and kick. They're phonetically very similar. You might expect that they're processed in very similar ways in the brain, but in fact, we see that they're not. So lick, you see activity in the brain about the parts of the brain that control the face. When you hear pick, you see activity in the parts that control the actions of the arm. And similarly with kick, you see activity in the parts that control the leg. So the processing of these, these very simple words is very different in the brain. Again, I think further evidence that there's a clear connection between the fundamental kind of way that we understand the world, and we think there's, there's a really clear embodied uh, rationale for that. 
so if you buy that argument about embodied cognition, it stands to reason that you could actually apply this to different kinds of learning. And there's a growing evidence that that's in fact possible. So this is a reason, recent study that shows that when students actually, they, they act out the types of things that they're reading in stories, that they see improved reading comprehension, uh, retention of those stories, right? And the other thing that's fascinating is that even if you just think about the activity, if students think about the activity itself, you see the same kinds of gain. So in fact, that we, if we couple an embodied experience to something abstract, more abstract like reading, that we can see that there can be value in the, in the context of learning. Okay, so that's a premise from where we're working. And so we've been looking at developing learning environments around uh, trying to address this question about what might the next kind of wave be. And we would term that as embodied learning. Okay, so we want to bring together these trends in HCI that we're looking at uh, together with the, with the research that we're looking, looking at around embodied cognition and develop learning environments. Um, this is ours. Um, the one on the left is a beautiful blue image as well, um, but this is a small lab environment. So it's an embodied learning environment where we use motion capture to track students in this space and couple that in a direct way to learning. I want to show you a quick example of that. So if you can play this video, this is my colleague, uh, Mina Johnson Glenberg, describing work around centripetal force. The handheld part here maps to the yellow ball that's close to the plus sign. And then as you swing it, you'll see that the tennis ball that's swinging around maps to the green ball that's moving. Coming out of that green moving ball are two vectors, one that's pinkish and coming straight out at a tangent, and that represents the tangent at that instant. And the other one is a yellow uh, vector that's heading towards the plus sign, and that represents centripetal force. In this case, centripetal force is the tension coming from the string. There are several different ways to swing this object. Um, they, you know, often when the kids first come out, they'll swing it sort of tentatively like this, but if you encourage them to hold it over its head, they can really get a good swing in there and get some real velocity going. Really watch the arrows get bigger and smaller, and also feel it in their arms in a very embodied way, how difficult or how easy it is to swing it. They can really feel centripetal force working on the string. The string is the tension that represents centripetal force. So the idea there is that we're, again, trying to couple this really direct physical experience with these other kinds of abstract representations in real time to develop for students an understanding of what centripetal force is. They feel it and they enact it. Um, on the next slide, we'll show a really quick example. This is chemistry learning, which just offers a different view of what an embodied learning experience could be. If you could play this, please. For example, let's say I have some unknown solution with some concentration of HCl. Pretend, pretend like, like we, don't we don't know what this pH is. is. What happens is that in the titration lab, you begin to add bases, and you know the molarity of this. And okay, that was really quick, sorry. I just want to give you a little taste of just what it looks like, a slightly different kind of learning experience. So, Again, our focus is about these learning environments, and there are three kind of tenets to how we define embodied learning. One is that it's really kinesthetic. You're physically active, moving about in real space. Second is that it's highly socio-collaborative. All these are examples of working in real physical spaces, direct kind of interaction in, in these real physical environments. And the third is a multimodal re representation, so visual, sonic, text, kinesthetic kinds of representations. We've developed a set of design principles, principles about how to design for these environments. And again, they're all premised on this basic hypothesis that greater sensory motor engagement is going to lead to greater learning gains. And of course, we've been looking at trying to test this uh, in real world context. So we did a recent study. This was actually using that chemistry example that you just saw, using a weightless control paradigm. So we divided students into two groups. We gave a measure at three points, an invariant measure, pre, mid, and post test. So we had the two groups divided into three, they had a three day intervention with that small lab learning experience and then three days of regular instruction where they actually did this titration lab, uh, the wet lab itself. And the other group had the regular instruction followed by three days of small lab. So we're trying to test how does small lab learning compare against the regular classroom instruction experience. Um, I've got the table there, but I wanna move on to show this graph. So the red line is showing three days of regular instruction with a modest gain, with a much larger gain followed by small lab. And the inverse is true with small lab coming first with the blue line followed by a more modest gain with students. So we see significant gains in this context. We're really encouraged about, and we've been able to replicate this with several other studies subsequently looking at different kinds of content areas and different kinds, uh, working with different kinds of teachers. So there seems to be a good, uh, good body of evidence that suggests that this is indeed possible, this coupling of embodied cognition with direct learning. 
But in thinking about advancing the field in general, there's obviously a lot more work to be done. There's some real challenges with thinking about data standards and conventions. One thing that we've been thinking about is how do you deliver personalized learning in this kind of a context where you don't have a student sitting in chair in front of a computer? It's much more difficult. Um, much more research is necessary to validate the, the early work that we've been doing. And of course, there needs to be additional uh, innovation around professional development for that. Just real quickly, part of what we're working on doing as well is building this out into other kinds of platforms. So taking embodied learning not only in the context of small lab, but also thinking about this is a newer one where we're looking at taking the technology from the Xbox and then being able to have embodied learning experiences that way. And this is sort of just our final vision to sum up the, the first slide, which is sort of the typical classroom on the left, one day later what it looks like when it's been turned into small lab. And that's kind of our vision for what this might look like as we outfit existing infrastructure with these kinds of cyber learning experiences. And with that, thank you very much.